Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Understanding Sensory Processing Struggles, or Processing Struggles, ooh, I'm tongue-tied, or um, as we renamed it, Sensory Overload. <laughs> We're excited to share this valuable information with you all today. Um, we really wanna help you understand what is at the root of your child's sensory processing challenges, and also give you some actionable steps to help your child right now when they feel overwhelmed or overloaded. Before I get started, I wanted to share a few housekeeping items. Um, first, we would like to just say thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time to listen to us. We're really humbled um, by the response that we've been getting from these webinars um, from families across the country and in other countries. Your feedback is really valuable to us. So before we get started, if you could just take a second and go to the questions tab on your GoToMeeting screen and go ahead and type in another topic besides sensory processing that you'd like to hear us speak about in the future. We're, we're gathering our ideas for our topics for 2020. And uh, we wanna make sure that this information is helpful to you. It's not just what we think you wanna hear and we think would be helpful, but what is truly going to help you and your family. Um, we will also in that section take all questions at the end, so you can type them in as we go. And lastly, we will be recording this webinar. It will be sent out to all who registered. I'll be reviewing that information and how to receive that email at the end of the webinar, so you can view it anytime on demand. And now I'd like to take this opportunity opportunity to introduce today's speaker, Rebecca Jackson, who is our Vice President of Programs and Outcomes for Brain Balance Centers. Rebecca joins us today with over, I can say now, after she had her 10 year anniversary, mm -hmm. 10 years experience helping families at Brain Balance. Um, and she just has so much of a wealth of information about sensory processing, a lot of experience working with families who have a child struggling with a sensory processing disorder or just some general sensory issues or challenges. And we know it's such an important topic to our families at Brain Balance. Um, I worked with families at Brain Balance and so was Rebecca's and we know how often children are struggling with sensory issues. So let's get started. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, thanks, Victoria. Sure. So that point of no return, the meltdown, the upset, that moment where you're just like, I've had enough. Um, for me, it happens anytime I'm in Las Vegas or this time of year, if I try to go to the mall or someplace busy. So we all have that point when too much sensory information kind of crosses our threshold of what we can tolerate or handle. And we all know that our threshold can vary from day to day. And, and for those of you who have joined my webinars before, we talk a lot about how our sleep impacts our tolerance for things, the importance of what we eat, stress management in our lives. So there's a lot of factors that allow us to have a little bit more of a threshold or more of an ability to be resilient to being bombarded by sensory information. However, we all have that point where where enough is enough, where it's too much. Um, and for a student or adult or older student that struggles with sensory processing, that threshold and that trigger point is gonna be lower than what it is for you or I. And it's so hard to understand because I've only lived in my body. While I've spent a lot of time with other families and students at Brain Balance, I only have experienced the world through the way my eyes take in information. I hear things, I see things, the way my brain processes things. So it's really hard to understand from the perspective of a student or adult who's struggling with sensory processing what that's really like for them. Um, in fact, one time I saw it was a YouTube video that was um, trying to emulate what it would be like to struggle with sensory processing. And the mom was pushing a shopping cart and I think it was through Costco and the video was blurred and the volume was really loud but I have to be honest I couldn't even watch the whole video it was too much it, it was just too much stimulation for me and I didn't like it at all um, so absolutely we have to understand that for somebody that processes sensory information too much this is very real and so saying to them oh you're fine that would Nothing would annoy me more than somebody saying to me, I'm fine when I'm not. So being um, aware and conscientious that the way somebody else processes and takes in information can very much be different um, than what it is, what our experience is for you and I. Um, so that point, that threshold is, is different for everyone, but we do all have that point where we get overwhelmed. And I think it's really important to understand um, and to keep in mind that sensory issues 
are not isolated to just the young kids. We see it most in the younger ages, and we do see a tendency that the more you age and develop, the better you do processing sensory information, but not everybody outgrows it. So you can absolutely have a high school, college student, an adult, somebody older that still um, processes sensory information more than what they should. Um, so we all get overwhelmed sometimes, but the question is, point as a parent do you worry at what point as a parent do you want to step in and over um, and intervene so the kind of the question is when is is enough enough um, and I think it's important to look at at what point um, does the sensory experience interfere with your students activities so if you have a child that is hesitant to engage in something because of the sensory experience so maybe they don't want to go to fourth of July fireworks or they don't want to go to that bounce house birthday party or they don't want to go hang out with a group of friends on Friday night um, or go to the, the local football game because it's too much sensory overload, which can be really exhausting and draining for somebody. So to me, when it gets to a point of interfering with your quality of life, that's a point where to me, that's a red flag to say, hey, we've got to take a closer look at this. Maybe it's time to do something about it. Um, I also think it's a big deal when it distracts from your ability to pay attention. So I'm doing this webinar from home. You'll see where a little festive for the holidays here. So of course I'm in my you know fuzzy slippers and, and lipstick up top. And I earlier had a little you know pebble in the bottom of my slipper. So my brain was aware of it, but I was able to deal with it and move on. But if if a student has sensory input that they're not able to address and move on, if that detracts from their ability to pay attention, if I was too distracted by the holiday lights and the decorations in my house and couldn't focus on what's in front of me, then again, um, that to me is a time where you want to step in and have a better understanding and, and work to create some change. Um, so again, that ability to be able to tune something out or move on. So sensory input is not just what we feel. So it's not just about tags and textures. Um, we can have people that are very sensitive to sound and the more mature we are with processing sound the better we are at being able to block out um, background noise to tune in and focus on something so for example a student sitting in the classroom if kids around them are whispering and and you know shuffling around and making noise and the teachers talking I should have the ability to tune that out and focus on what the teacher is saying but if I'm somebody that has heightened sensory processing then I'm gonna have a greater it's gonna be harder for me to tune that out um, in fact I was um, I was at a, a school meeting um, for one of the students enrolled in Brain Balance years ago. It was a middle school student, and so we were meeting with the full team of teachers. And the student was doing um, in the middle of Brain Balance, so we were talking about concerns and in, in areas of growth. And one of the teachers commented that the student had been doing so well, and they recently changed his seat in class, and now he was getting really frustrated and upset. Well, I happened to get to the section um, talking about the student's information where I started talking about processing senses and his ability um, to process auditory information. And I said, this is a student who can't do not background noise and they're gonna hear every little thing. And the principal was the one that had this huge aha moment to say when they shifted him in class, they shifted him and he's now sitting next to somebody that's a mouth breather. And so the kid sitting next to him is now, <sighs> you know, breathing loud all day, and it's been driving the student nuts. And so being aware that that was a trigger and a distraction for this student, um, where they were able to change where he was sitting in the classroom, and then at Brain Balance, of course, we continued to work on maturing things so that the hope is um, that student can eventually sit anywhere in the classroom and be successful and not be distracted by that background noise. So again, um, if you've got a student or you yourself don't have that ability to tune things out, that's again a red flag um, that these sensory pieces are disruptive in your life and, and having an impact. What does research tell us? Um, there are 5% of today's kids that are formally diagnosed with sensory processing disorder. And what we know that that's really only a fraction of the case. Um, I can say for my own child that we'll talk about in a little while, um, even doing what I do here at Brain Balance, it hadn't occurred to us up front that she was a sensory kid. And so um, come to find out, we did realize that, that she was overly sensitive to things, but we never took her in or had her diagnosed. Diagnosed. So that 5% of kids, those are um, only the students that have been formally diagnosed. So again, we know that that number is going to be significantly higher for those um, that are impacted by the senses so that it is disruptive and distracting. Um, it's also really important to know and understand that a high percentage of these kids 
are going to struggle with other pieces as well. As we learn more about sensory processing today and how the brain grows and builds, you're going to see that if we have an impact on something that's in a low area of very early development, there's going to be a residual impact on higher level pieces. So studies have looked at the impact on areas of cognition. And so we can see a correlation that if a student has um, concerns with sensory processing, there's going to be a higher likelihood that they may struggle with things like working memory, um, attention and focus, executive function pieces that go along with cognition. And um, there's an interesting study that I read the other day um, talking about students that are um, children that are born um, early. So um, a child born premature, there's a higher likelihood of developing um, sensory pieces as well. Um, and again, they're seeing a relationship between sensory processing and neurobehavioral concerns. What neurobehavioral concerns are going to, again, be referring to are going to be things like ADHD, impulse control. Um, so again, neurobehavior kind of speaks to just about everything because the brain's involved with everything. Um, but again, like the study on cognition is we're seeing a correlation of if a student is struggling with sensory pieces, there's a higher likelihood that there's going to be other things that are impacted as well. So additional struggles. And, and it's important to understand years ago, it was thought that sensory processing was sort of a part of some other diagnoses. It is considered its own standalone. So just because you have sensory processing doesn't mean that you also have autism. Those are two separate pieces. Now we know that there's a high likelihood of a child on the spectrum is also going to struggle with sensory pieces, but just because you struggle with sensory doesn't mean you're also going to have ADHD, autism, um, or any other concerns. So it is its own standalone piece. But again, what we're seeing is because of how the brain works and functions that there's a higher likelihood for other complications. So how does the brain work? So this is my little guy, Drew, and he's a, a chubby little one. Um, and our brain builds and learns how to process sensory information through play and repetition. One of my favorite things to do is to just watch a baby move and play. And you can tell so much about a baby or a child or even an adult's brain just through observation. So babies play with things like sound. So when a baby is bub bub, you know, playing with sound and bub 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 and banging on wooden spoons, that play is how they're starting to play with sensory input. So they make a noise and they see what that sounds like. So they bang it hard and it's loud, they bang it soft um, and it's a, a quieter noise. Um, when we look at, at touch sensation, as a baby is crawling and moving and they're going from the carpet to the hardwood floor, to the sidewalk outside and to the grass, that's flooding that brain with new sensory information. And so these senses are built through play and exploration and through repetition. So we know if a child is in a scenario, you know, let's say it's a, an extreme scenario of neglect. So maybe it's a, a baby that's been left unattended for hours in a crib. We know that kids um, that have been deprived sensory experiences, it's going to impact and hold back brain development. So again, our senses develop through play. Um, I think it's so interesting the way the brain develops the difference of understanding self versus not self. So again, as a baby, they're going to stick their thumb in their mouth, they're going to stick their hand in their mouth, and when they bite down, it hurts. So they very quickly learn, don't bite myself, I don't want to hurt myself. Versus you can pick up a teddy bear, stick that teddy bear in and bite, and it doesn't hurt but it might be unpleasant to have that fuzzy. And so as babies putting everything in their mouth, that's how they're learning the difference between me and not me from hard, from soft, from fuzzy, from shiny. So the brain learns through exposure. The piece that happens along with this is we've got um, reflexes. So quick little mini neuro lesson, bear with me here. I'll try to make it at least a little interesting. Babies should be born with a set of infant or primitive reflexes. These are all measured right away at birth, and they're there as survival mechanisms. So babies born with a brain that has, you know, millions and billions of cells, but there's not the connection to use those pieces yet. So it's a brain that just isn't functional like it becomes as we become older. But then what happens is there's a sensory input. So for example, baby's born and I go to nurse. When when baby's cheek gets stimulated, there's a sensory input, and then there's a response that the baby's going to turn and latch. So that's how a baby, moments old, hopefully is able to latch on to nurse right away. So what happens is there's sensory input that goes from the skin up to the brain to say, hey, 
there's something there. So that's waking up my cheek, waking up my touch sensation and connecting that with my brain. Then there's a reflex motor response that's having me use that muscle. So those reflexes that we're born with still start to build the sensory part of our brain. They also start to build our muscles for movement. So the more we stimulate that rooting reflex, so was as you go to nurse or bottle feed, and the baby's having to root around to find uh, the nipple to nurse or feed, and they're then having to work to suck and swallow. Each time that reflex is being stimulated, they're turning on senses and they're developing the muscles. So the baby starts to have the ability to suck, to swallow, to eventually chew and speak. Same thing happens, um, we can give another example with the hand. What happens with an infant, they don't have control over their fingers. They can't do a pincer or grasp. With an infant, the whole system moves as a unit. So as, a, as an infant, if we touch that hand, the baby automatically does that full hand grasp. It's the sweetest thing, so you've got that you know, tiny little baby grasping onto your finger. But again, what's really happening here is I touch the hand, it's giving sensory information to the brain to start processing touch, there's a motor response, and guess what, that just activated my muscles. When we do that enough, the brain learns how to turn off this type of reflex, and now I have control over it. So I can choose to open and close my hand if I want. I can choose to ignore that stimuli or react to it in a controlled way. So these reflexes were born with our survival mechanisms that start to build connections in the brain and start to allow our brain to, to make sense of information and to control our responses. Hopefully that made a little bit of sense. Um, so again, what's going to happen with the reflex is there's that sensory input in, motor response out. So we're starting to build the parts of the brain um, that control those reactions. So where this is happening in the brain is very low down in the brainstem area. So when you see that girl kind of in the lower portion, um, so these reflexes, but then they're turning on and engaging higher levels of the brain that process sensory information and control and engage the muscles. And the more we do something, the more we're eventually building these networks and connections and pathways so that our brain can make fast, efficient responses. Now, another thing that happens through growth and development is our brain is constantly building new connections and pathways, but then the brain needs to decide which are the most efficient pathways to use. What's the best way to get from point A to point B? So what was interesting to me to learn a few years ago is at two years of age, we actually have more connections in our brain than at any other time. So here I am, considerably older than two. I've done a lot of school and learning and growth. Um, so hopefully always building new pathways. But in fact, I had more pathways as a two-year-old than I do now as an educated adult. So what happens is it's not just about building new pathways, it's about pruning. So figuring out what are the most important, most efficient pathways. So one of the things that happens is, so let's say I've got you know point A and point B, and maybe my brain has 10 different connections or pathways, 10 different ways to get me from point A to point B. My brain over time is going to develop the ability to say, what's the fastest, most effective route? So then my brain's going to maintain that, that ultimate connection, and I'm going to stop using these other connections. So I, in my brain, I'm a very visual learner, I picture it to be like roads, and so my brain's going to stop using that dirt side road and start using that interstate. So that process is called pruning. And one of the things that we're seeing in studies is when you look at a child, um, a lot has been looked at this with um, on the autism spectrum is what we're seeing with autism is the appropriate pruning isn't taking place and so brain isn't developing that same level of speed and organization and efficiency so and same thing can be said with sensory processing so it's almost like if you picture where the brain is processing too much information. It's, it's tuned up or amplified. So what we wanna do is through use and activation, through lots of exposure, lots of movement um, and stimulation to develop the brain, encourage the brain to prune on its own so we develop those pathways. And what we see happening is the more we do very specific movement and coordination, we actually start to see a reduction in that sensory input. Um, and we'll see kids go through shifts and changes when that happens. And so we might have a student that gets to a point when they're watching television where they're having to turn the sound down because it's now becoming too loud for them or they're needing to turn the sound up. So we'll see shifts and changes in how that brain processes and takes in information. So pruning is an important part of that. 
So what are some clues um, that your student may be struggling with sensory pieces? Um, and again, why we care about that is we want um, our kids to have a great experience. We don't want sensory anxiety or any concerns holding them back from experiencing life. And we want to remove any roadblocks that may um, impact later um, skills and functions like our executive function pieces. Um, so some clues to consider. So this is my daughter Morgan as a young child. Um, and again with our dog Ben, we didn't think of Morgan as a sensory kid. She never talked about tags or textures. She never complained about things. However, uh, what we would notice is the second we got home, she really liked to take all of her clothes off. So again, she wouldn't complain about anything, but the second she had an opportunity, socks and shoes would come off, um, shirts, I mean, you can see here, she's in you know, panties, a tutu, and hanging out with her dog, and, and that's it. First time parents, we didn't think anything of it. We thought, you know, she's a kid who's not self-conscious, um, so we didn't think of it. Um, other pieces we'd see with Morgan, we knew her hair was an issue. She would scream bloody murder in the bathtub. She did not like water on her ears or on her face. Again, silly me, I didn't think of that as a sensory piece. I just thought she was afraid of the water. Um, and so the honest answer is there were plenty of times when we skipped washing her hair when she was young because screaming in a porcelain bathroom is not a pleasant experience. Um, so the irony is Morgan did brain balance as a four-year-old. Um, and again, we just did it because we wanted to optimize function. We weren't thinking of it in terms of, of sensory concerns. And on the very last day of program, Morgan put on a pair of skinny jeans that had been in her drawer for years. And after doing brain balance, she left her clothes on. She started swimming that summer with her head underwater. So we saw a huge shift and change in her sensory pieces. So clues for you um, on sensory pieces are um, you know, the obvious answer is when kids um, complain about something, so they get upset um, if their hands um, are dirty or they're very particular with certain textures, with clothing. Um, but again, you just might see some levels of anxiety or hesitance around not wanting to do or engage in things. Um, and as we talked about earlier, is we know if there's some sensory pieces in place that there's an impact potentially in other areas of well as well. So when you take a look at this developmental pyramid, the primitive, those infant reflexes that we just touched on, that's the green part of the pyramid. That's the base of the pyramid. So in so many ways, this is the base of our early brain development. So if we have any concerns here in early development, it's going to make it harder to get to the top. And that yellow part of the pyramid that's where our attention and focus, good decision making, impulse control, the ability to listen and not interrupt somebody, all of those higher level pieces we need to be successful in school and work and relationships with friendships. Those executive function pieces come from all aspects of the brain working together the way they're supposed to. So again, if I have a child that's over-processing or student over-processing sensory information and I'm putting them in a classroom, I'm asking that child to be taking in visual information, auditory information, hold still, pay attention, remember what you're hearing and writing it down. Multitasking the brain is an executive function piece. So again, if I have any gaps and holes in development along the way, and sensory is one of the biggest red flags early on for concerns and how this development is coming together, it's going to be harder to multitask the brain. So instead, I'm going to have the child that gets distracted every time you know somebody walks by the open door or a kid gets up to go sharpen their pencil. I'm going to be distracted by visual input or by noise. I'm going to have a harder time focusing and using all aspects of my brain together in coordination. So again, what we're seeing is there are many kids that do outgrow sensory concerns, but what we're seeing is, is oftentimes it just looks different in an older child. It doesn't mean that the concern isn't there any longer. So what started as sensory processing in a 17-year-old might present as anxiety and attention and focus. And we wouldn't call it sensory processing, but we know from that developmental um, the chain of events that happens with development, that, that's what we can see going forward. But just to be clear, I'm not saying that if your child has sensory pieces now that they're going to have ADHD when they're older. I'm not trying to say that at all. It's just we're seeing a higher likelihood of concerns in those areas um, coming forward. So again, as the brain continues to move up in development, um, we just see these things presenting and playing out different over time.
So the question is, you know, is the goal to mask the symptom or do we want to change why the symptom is present in the first place? And then in the meantime, we also have to support our child or student so that they're able to be successful in the classroom. They're not melting down at home. Um, so again, what we're looking at at Brain Balance is we want to understand where the gaps and holes are in development so that we can mature that aspect of brain development so that brain naturally prunes on its own and the student is processing things at a more appropriate level so we get to those um, attention and focus pieces, those high-level executive functions. Um, so again, other areas of impact that we'll often see um, along with sensory pieces. The student may struggle more with attention and focus. We can see higher levels of anxiety, of worry, of stress. Um, the struggle, kids can struggle with auditory and visual processing. It's hard to pick up on visual processing struggle. You can see a child struggling with catching. Um, auditory processing is a little easier to catch up on where the student will have a hard time following multi-step directions or you'll find them saying what often. Um, it can impact our social interactions, um, not just from a developmental perspective, but also if I'm getting caught up in what's happening and I'm not paying attention to what's being said or watching those facial cues to know how I should act or react, it can have a negative impact on social as well in those executive function pieces. Um, so let's, let's take a minute and back up to say, okay, we're coming up to the holidays, so this is a lot of parties and events and a lot of things going on. Um, what are some tips and strategies um, to help get through the moment? And I think one of the most important things is, is as parents, we tend to know our kids and know their cues, and we always want to stay ahead of things rather than behind things. So once somebody gets to that point of meltdown, um, you saw the slide at the beginning with my son Drew um, crying in the car, once they get to the point of meltdown, there's kind of no coming back from that. Once we get into that sympathetic fight or flight mode, it takes the healthy system up to 20 minutes to recover and reset, which means our kids that are full of, of developmental immaturity as a result of just being a child, it's gonna take that system longer to reset. So certainly we wanna catch things before they get to that point. So I'm gonna watch to see what are the signs that, that things are kind of starting to amp up for my student. Um, with some kids, their faces will actually get red and flushed or their hands will get clammy. So you start to see things kind of build Building. Some students will see that they start to get super agitated. So maybe they're up and pacing and walking around. They're going to start to get really negative um, and less compliant. Um, and so we want to do to kind of help capture things before we get to that meltdown mode is, is to reduce as much sensory input as possible. And so removing the, the um, student from this scenario and getting them into a calmer environment. Um, and I would try to work on this strategy preemptively. So maybe say to the host, hey, you know, sometimes Drew can get a little overwhelmed when there's a lot of chaos going on. So if you see me grab him and go outside for a walk, just know I'm, I'm helping him to calm down so that he can enjoy the day more. And I talk to your student about it too, of, you know, hey, sometimes these parties can be a lot for me. And I know sometimes they are for you as well. Let's have a plan of, you know, maybe we're going to take a break. Um, kids get embarrassed. And so we don't want to make a big deal in front of other people. Uh, so maybe depending on the age and maturity of your student, you can have a code word of, you know, chocolate means it's time. Let's, let's go take a few quiet minutes together. And you can set this up in a positive way. This isn't a punishment. This isn't a, hey, you're about to melt down. Your student's brain, they can't control the fact that, that they're experiencing sensory information in a, in a skewed and amplified manner. And so you want to do this as a positive thing of, hey, buddy, I get it. I'm here to help you. So if you're needing a break, come tell me that code word and we'll go outside. And, you know, a couple things that you would want to do is reduce the stimuli. So if it's really loud, find a quiet area that you can sit and hang out. Physical touch is a huge comforter. And so if you're able to hold your student's hand and go for a walk or, you know, depending on their age and size, Hold them on your lap and just sit quietly together. Um, low tone, low frequency is very calming. And, and as parents, when we're getting frustrated and our child's getting frustrated, we tend to do the opposite. We start to talk faster and, our, and we're, we get louder and we start to get mad of, come on, hold it together, you too old to melt down. Um, and when we get louder and more in their face, that's going to trigger things even more. And so we want to really be calm and come under the student. And so again, you know, quietly removing them from the environment, even just taking, you know, something as small as 10 minutes to just hold 
or be together or just talk calm and quiet. We do have to understand that once the child gets in or student gets into that meltdown mode, that's not the time to have a conversation or redirect. When they're in meltdown, they're processing things in only a few second increments. So to say to them, pull it together or else there's a timeout, or if you wanna go play this game, you've gotta stop, that's not a reasonable expectation to have because um, all of us, you know, when you think of when you're in an argument with your husband, not that I ever argue with my husband, but however, if it were to happen, you know, when you're in that really heated, you're just, you're not thinking ahead. And so it's the same thing with our kids when they're in that meltdown mode. Um, another way to kind of recapture things to help things stay on track is engaging the muscles. And so again, if I see that my child is really starting to amp up and I'm like, oh boy, here we go. One of the things that you can do is, is again, grab them, remove them from this scenario and use the muscles. So we have a trampoline in our backyard. Um, and so I'd say, you know, hey, why don't you go take 10 minutes and just go jump outside by yourself? I wouldn't send them out there with 20 other kids. But using large muscle groups um, is engaging um, muscles wakes up the brain. It essentially sets the idle speed for our brain. So by using large muscle groups of the body, it's going to help to kind of wake up and refocus the brain. If you don't have a trampoline in the backyard, get creative. You know, you can go for a walk. You can and do it with your student. You can do, you know, deep lunges and jumps. Um, doing a little something to increase heart rate so you're getting oxygen flowing and using large muscle groups of the body can help to kind of reset and calm that system. Um, another thing that you can do, but I want you to be careful with this, is when we chew, it releases digestive enzymes, and so it's bringing um, oxygen and blood to the core to digest, and so that can be kind of a calming thing as well. Um, I say be careful with this because we don't want to start to get into the habit of my kid's about to melt down, here's a snack, here's a piece of gum, um, but, but again, being aware of, gosh, you know, it's been three hours since we've had lunch. Um, you know, maybe this is the time to do a protein snack. And it is really important, like I mentioned earlier, lots of sleep, good, healthy nutrition, protein. Those are all things that can help all of us tolerate the stresses in life more. Um, so if you have a child that's very sensitive to how frequently they eat protein, that can also um, really help to turn the tide on things as well. Um, another piece that's going to work against us in this scenario is going to be spending a lot of time on something like video games. Um, video games, while they have some positives and can be really fun and engaging for the kids and keep them occupied for large chunks of time, we have to remember that video games are extremely fatiguing on the brain. And typically when a student is sitting um, or playing a video game, they're seated. So they're not engaging muscles and senses and they're fatiguing the brain. So we're always going to see more in the way of negative behaviors following video games. And so it's just a great um, habit to get into of, you know, yes, you can play video games, but you've got to do something before um, that's physical before and after so that we're re-engaging the brain, the parts that help us to regulate and control and make good decisions. So overall, again, you know, if you see that starting to escalate scenario, removing from the scenario, dropping the senses, low light, calm voice and tone, um, fewer words. And so rather than saying, buddy, I know you're starting to get really stressed because there's a lot of chaos happening, do a, hey, let's just take a few minutes and hang out. How you doing? So fewer words, low tone, just nice and calming. Physical touch is hugely um, comforting. And again, there's great research and studies to show that. Um, kind, gentle touch, not the touch of siblings sometimes. Um, and again, engaging muscles, um, heart rate, those are all great pieces to help avoid the moment. You can apply every single strategy to after the moment to help get to that um, back on track phase faster. So again, if the child's in the middle of the meltdown, that's not the time to say, okay, let's jump on the trampoline right now. But as they calm down and start you know, kind of the crying stops and they're calming down, then I would take them to go do something physical to again, just kind of help reset the system. So just a couple of tips and strategies for um, managing things um, in the moment. Um, so then, you know, when we look at what can we do to change this, what we know is the biggest drivers of developing the brain are our senses and our muscles. And like we shared in the example earlier, nearly everything that we're doing is using lots of parts of our brain all together in sync at the same time. And so we want to make sure that that's the way we're exercising um, our brain and body. You know, if you think about it, old school exercise used to be something like a bicep curl where you would ice step and just work that muscle isolation. 
these days, our workouts, workouts are all more about functional fitness. And so, you know, you look at the CrossFit videos and it's not bicep curl that's isolated. They're maybe dragging a tire across the parking lot. I don't do CrossFit, so that's maybe not a good example. But, you know, it's, it's how do we use these things in real life? And that's what we're doing here at Brain Balance is when we're using our senses, we're not using our senses in isolation. We're using our senses while we're engaging our muscles and body coordination and timing. And these are all the pieces that allow us to then be successful, again, with those high-level executive function pieces. And so by engaging the brain and body and addressing those developmental pieces, we're able to see um, some great improvements in how a student's brain takes in sensory information, their ability to focus um, and do well in multiple environments. Um, and so then what does it look like when these sensory pieces change? Uh, this is my daughter Morgan, the one that used to just hate water. And again, we didn't think of it as a sensory piece. However, when that changed in a matter of a two month period, she went from hating to, to wash her hair to being able to swim and put her head underwater, no problem. So for Morgan, we watched just a shift and change in her quality of life of the things that she wanted to do, the things that she was comfortable engaging in and my sense is is that there was some you know hesitation with trying new things and it might have been from a fear of you know the sensory experience is going to be too much for me and so I, I don't want to change and engage and so again when we see those sensory um, systems calming and being more age appropriate we'll see a reduction in anxiety and stress and worries kids are more comfortable pushing the boundaries and trying something new and different. Um, so again, we'll see overall um, just an increase in the child's comfort within their own skin, um, confidence, those pieces that, that we want for all of our kids. Um, so again, our focus at Brain Balance is we wanna not just understand what is the challenge that the child's facing, we wanna understand why? Why is that there in the first place? And for me, understanding where something is coming from is what allows us to create an action plan to create change for things going forward so that these um, challenges aren't holding us back. All of us have areas of strength and weakness, but what we see with our kids is if we have these gaps and holes, we see greater inconsistency in our behavior, in our function, in our mood. And so by plugging in those gaps and holes, then we kind of, you know, with those strengths and weaknesses, we're able to balance things out so that we have less inconsistency um, in a child's mood and behavior and academics and focus, all of those pieces. Um, so that was a little bit about brain balance. We do work with kids as young as four, um, all the way through young adult. Um, we are a drug-free program um, and we've worked with over 45,000 kids um, and young adults um, at this point. And again, sensory pieces are one of the most common things that we see. Um, coming into the center. So lots of parents with questions and concerns. Um, and for us, you know, starting with the assessment is always a great place to start. Um, you know, parents always ask the question of, am I seeing this because he's a six-year-old boy or is there something more here? And our assessments are based on a lot of scientifically validated tools of measurement that are based on age and gender. And so we're able to answer that question of, nope, you're right on track for where you should be, or you know what, for a six-year-old boy, there's a couple pieces that are behind where they should be, and this is what this is impacting and what we can do to change that. So our goal and focus is always giving as much help and support as we can, but understanding the why so that we can create movement and change going forward. Uh, Victoria, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the tools that we have for this month? Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to let everyone know, we, we know we received a lot of questions and we anticipated that. So we are going to take the questions in about two more slides. And <clears throat> we have a great amount of time to, I think, get to all of your questions today. So I'm excited about that. Um, we really appreciate you attending with us today as a gift for registering. So in the email that you'll receive to us that does contain the announcement for next month's webinar, the um, it will have the recording or a link to watch the recording. And again, you can just plug that in on your phone, on the internet, and you can, as Rebecca and I were trying to think of different ways of, of 
of repurposing this webinar in 2020, we want to make sure that you can listen to this on the go. And we think that that recording on our website really helps you with that. Um, we will be sending you also as a gift, say thank you. Thank you for following along with us. Thank you for joining us today. Our holiday survival guide, um, it's a three page guide. We put it together to give families helpful tips to support your child during the holidays. It's not just for, for families with sensory processing struggles with their child, but really for you know a child if you're with a family if your child is struggling or not this is a great guide for you it's filled with shopping lists uh, the shopping lists are broken down by a child's specific needs it's filled with recipes it's filled with holiday activity ideas screen time recommendations um, for your school break and much more so we create these guides as a monthly resource putting together what we think are the best tips for parents to navigate the holidays. Um, and if your child is struggling, I think that you'll really find the guide to be helpful this year. So again, look for an email for, from us. I wanted to just give a um, quick reminder that next month's webinar, and we'll be sending you that registration link, is a really timely topic for us. It's how nutrition affects behavior and focus. So we're really excited. We're going to have a guest speaker, um, our head of nutrition, Holly Larson. She's a registered dietitian and runs our Brain Balance Nutrition Program, which is called Balance 360. And she'll be guest starring with us and Rebecca next month. Can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Okay, so um, as just a special thing this month, if you or someone you know has a child who's struggling with sensory processing, feeling overwhelmed with sensory input around them, like we discussed today, we encourage you to reach out to us for help. We're here to support you and to create a specific plan for your child. That process starts, I got a lot of your questions today about how do I get started with brain balance? That process starts with scheduling an assessment in your local, local center. So if you go to brainbalance.com, you can go on our center finder, find the, the nearest center to you, schedule an assessment. We have a very special offer. And the reason why I, I use the word special is because we only offer this $500 enrollment scholarship twice a year. And the month of December is one of those times. So we did want to highlight that as part of the webinar today. If you're considering brain balance or you have a family member who is, we wanted to make sure that you understand that this $500 scholarship is being extended to participate, extending to families at participating centers. Um, and you can, again, contact your local center. I just got another question about that. How can I find out about the discount? Um, just contact your local center for the $500 scholarship and they can explain the details to you. Rebecca, can you go to the next slide while we take questions? Okay, if you guys don't mind one second while I just go to the top for all of our questions. Here we go. Okay, we have a, two of the same question um, along the lines of, if, my, if I think my child has a sensory processing issue but I'm unsure, how would I get them diagnosed? Yeah, you know, um, to me, I guess I wanna take a step back first and my first question with the diagnosis is always, you know, what's the goal that you have for your child? There are absolutely times where having a diagnosis is helpful. So for example, if you're wanting accommodations in school, you may need a diagnosis either from your school or your physician to provide those, um, those interventions. For me, I care less about what to call it and more about what can I do to change it so that hopefully a diagnosis isn't necessary. Um, so if you're needing a diagnosis for accommodations, um, starting with your school is always a great place to start um, or um, your pediatrician as well to say, you know, is this something you diagnose? If not, who do you recommend? Um, our focus at Brain Balance, you know, to us, it's not about the label. It's what are the concerns and challenges and how can we change it? And again, the hope is then the label um, is less applicable or no longer applicable. Great, thank you. Um, this parent asked, I remember this question came in from Brooke, around the time that you were discussing that if a child has sensory issues as a child, where the sensory issues are really outright in the way that they present themselves, they may end up having some anxiety or ADHD or it may present as anxiety or ADHD later on, maybe as a teen. 
And this question is, in the latter, does that mean that a child with ADHD or anxiety and other issues actually have underlying sensory issues? You know, quite possibly. Um, when you look at the way the brain develops, nothing develops in isolation. Every time you light one neuron or nerve in the brain, it connects with up to a thousand other neurons. And so if I have a child that struggles with, a fo with focus, there's going to be lots of other things that are also related. And it's funny because we tend to look at everything so siloed. We tend to look at, you know, sensory and body coordination and my child's behavior is all separate things. But the reality is so many of these things are interconnected. So, you know, there can be a direct correlation between a child that experiences sensory pieces heightened is going to be more anxious, um, you know, because maybe they're stressed about going into an environment. Maybe it's going to be loud. Maybe it's going to be really taxing and tiring for them. But there's also an indirect correlation of, the child that has sensory pieces is going to have immaturity in some areas of the brain and an immature area of the brain is less able to tolerate and handle stress. So if you think about a two-year-old, it's normal, typical, okay development for a two-year-old to have meltdowns and tantrums. I don't expect a 10-year-old to have meltdowns and tantrums the same way. So as we mature, we handle stress and frustration better. So if I have pockets of immaturity, then my brain is less able to handle stress. So, um, so yes, you can see a, an inner, you know, a correlation. I don't want to say one causes the other, um, but there's overlapping pieces where how everything is connected, um, and then there's also that impact of heightened sensory can increase anxiety. It can be very distracting for focus. So yes, it's very possible that a child with um, struggle focus and anxiety focus also may have some underlying sensory pieces, and that would be a part of improving things, right? If we're only working on, you know, if the child's struggling with anxiety and we're just um, doing talk strategies on write your worries in a journal or, you know, think about how this impacts you or exercise to help relax, if I'm not changing how my brain perceives sensory input, I'm not changing one of the stressors impacting me. So that's where to me, and um, I always want to go back and look at full picture to understand not just what the symptom or challenge is, how does this all fit together? I hope that makes sense. <laughs> it does. Okay, so we have another question from Christine. Hi, Christine. My son has sensory processing disorder and ADHD. The hardest issue we have is with food. We will, he will only eat super soft food that is not chewy basically no meat except hamburger, and he won't even eat pasta. He also is very resistant to trying anything new. It's a major battle. Any advice on what I can do to help him? Yeah, um, I, my heart goes out to you. To me, I said to another parent years ago when my kids were little, as if I didn't have to feed kids, I would have had so much more of them, but feeding kids is hard, and what we feed them matters. What we feed them becomes the building rock blocks for their brain to grow and develop. Um, so absolutely, I can imagine there's huge amounts of stress when you're struggling to get protein and nutrients in. Um, so again, to me, I look at, okay, why? Lots of kids are picky eaters, not as many kids are picky to that degree. So what's going on different in your child's brain that they're um, perceiving this? So, you know, something just super simple um, is doing lots of stimulation to the cheeks. So that goes back to that rooting reflex that we talked about earlier. And so getting stimulation here is waking up the part of the brain that controls this whole area. And so a child that is skewed in their ability to process things here, it's more difficult for them to chew. You may also see some speech and enunciation pieces. Your child may have more of a tendency to overstuff and overfill their mouth or not feel or notice when they've got like a glob of ketchup on their face. Um, so again, going back to all these things are interconnected. So bringing tons of sensory stimulation and input to this region can help wake up that part of the brain. Now, it's not as simple as just that. That's just one small example. Um, but to me, when there's heightened or skewed sensory input, we've got to go back to that base and foundation, those primitive reflexes, because that's going to impact how our brain perceives smell. Smell and taste are very closely tied in and related and connected. Um, and that ability to chew and swallow and that ability to perceive text, um, texture and touch. Um, so I, I don't know where you live. If it's possible, I would definitely want to start with an assessment in the center, because that's going to show you um, if, if things are showing up, then there's 
an action plan to create change for that. If primitive reflexes are fine and all these other things are on track, then that's a different answer and path um, to take to help. So to me, um, it starts with understanding um, where the gaps and holes are that are creating these challenges for your child. Okay, great. Um, is it possible that my child has an increase in stimming due to brain overload? She is a five, almost six year old girl. Yeah, um, so stimming is an interesting thing. Um, so for those of you watching, if you don't know, um, we'll have kids do, it, it's kind of a repetitive motion and lots of kids stim different ways. Some kids rock, some kids bang their head. I mean, there's a million different ways that you can stim. Um, lots of different theories for that. One of the theories is that brain is really seeking a timing component. Our brain is all about timing. Cerebellum um, sets timing components for our brain and we need accurate timing for me to have a thought, get it in order and get it out so that you can hopefully follow along and understand takes timing. So there's some theories that are saying stimming is a child kind of trying to reset or address the timing mechanism in the brain. And so they're kind of trying to ground themselves that way. Um, other theories looking at stimming is if it's a child that's actually seeking or craving sensory input. One example is if I were to close my eyes and put my hands in the air and try to visualize where they are, I can picture where they are. But now if I move that part, I become much more aware of that part. So for some students, they may be stimming because maybe they're not sensing and feeling their body the way they should. So by banging their head against something or shaking their hands or again, whatever the stimming piece may be, it may actually be providing them with sensory input that's gonna ground and comfort the body. So we can see a tendency to stim when a child is getting anxious or excited or overwhelmed. Um, so it can happen from being overwhelmed with sensory input, but to me, there's more to it than just that. And so again, if I'm seeing, I wanna go back and see, where is that child's primitive reflexes? Are their core muscles at age appropriate? Where is their body coordination and body awareness at? Um, because I'm really needing to see change in maturity in all of those pieces to see a reduction in the stimming. So I maybe got too complex on that answer, but um, great question. Another just simple thing, doing something like jumping. When we jump, it provides input to nearly every joint in our body. And so if you're seeing you know, times when your child's needing to stim, Think of it as your child's body saying, hey, I'm, I'm needing some more input. So spending some time jumping can be just like a quick barrage of, of input to the system that can actually be calming for some kids. Awesome. Okay, we have a couple more minutes for questions. Okay. Um, my seven-year-old boy has big issues with kid-based movies that have angry faces or mean voices. He's smart. He likes nonfiction movies and books but he really likes younger G-type movies because those don't have a villain. So I guess the follow-up question would be how to get him to, you know, have a likeness for more mature movies. Yeah. Um, interesting question. I don't know that I've ever been asked that that way before. You know, our ability to perceive and understand facial expression is so important in everything in life. It's one of the things that I really struggle about with these webinars is I can't see my audience. So I have no idea if you're bored out of your mind, if you're nodding along, if I've lost you. Um, and so that that ability to read um, body language and facial expression is so important. And oftentimes what we'll see, we all go through a learning curve with this, right? So when I'm little, I don't know what any of this means, but um, when we're little babies, you know, we do the hi, we do really exaggerated facial expressions and high pitch and fewer words. And, you know, kids start to recognize, you know, something like a firm no before they actually can understand the words. And then we continue to learn these nuances over time. But for a child that doesn't sense and feel their own body, they have a harder time identifying what facial expression means in somebody else. So when I have a child whose awareness is enough to recognize it, but not enough to understand what it means, they often take that personally. And I'm going to share an example. Uh, my sister worked with us in center for years, and we had a student that said, I don't like Miss Lisa. I don't want to work with Miss Lisa. And she was always one of the favorites. So we're like, sure, tell me more. What's going on? Um, you know, <laughs> I want to understand. And the, the kid said, Miss Lisa doesn't like me. And so I thought that was kind of strange. So as we dug into it more and more, finally what we found out is 
Miss Lisa, my sister has a thinking face and her thinking face is a little bit more stern. That child saw that facial expression and applied his own meaning to it. And his meaning was, she doesn't like me, I don't wanna work with her. So we called Miss Lisa in and we had her say, and I said, Lisa, show me your mad face. So she did a mad face. And I said, show me your thinking face. And she did her thinking face. So we, we made a game out of it and I said, okay, Tell me when you see the face that you're talking about. And so we had her go through all these different things and the thinking face was the face that that child saw. And so then we had a conversation to say, this is what her thinking face is. If you see the mad face, then that means she's not happy with you and you've never seen her make that face before. Um, so long story to say, um, it's great that he's aware of an angry face or a mad face. Um, my Sometimes, again, kids are going to fill in their own meaning until they're there. Um, to me, it, that's a sign that he's not developmentally ready for that next level of movie. And so I wouldn't push that until he is ready. Um, and I don't know if that bothers me in a seven-year-old. If that's the only thing that you're seeing or worried about, then I would just enjoy the G movies for a little bit longer because pretty soon they're going to discover that Star Wars and all these other movies are really fun. You've got the rest of your life for that. If you're seeing other things as well, if you're seeing sensory pieces and you're seeing where he tends to gravitate towards younger kids rather than kids his own age, or if you're seeing other things as well and a tendency to prefer immature movies, then that's when I would want to look into it a little bit more to say, okay, is this an example or a red flag that there is aspects of immaturity and his development impacting things. Okay, I hope we can get into more questions, but really quick, we did have about four or five questions about um, helping, can brain balance help teens? Is that too late for sensory processing? No, issues? no, 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 it's not too late at all. In fact, I would love to do whole programs or whole centers just with um, high school and college kids. Um, the older kids, it's so fun because they can verbalize the change as it's happening. So they can tell you, my brain used to feel like this and now I can sit and focus and I'm not distracted. So absolutely, it's not too late. If anything, we often see change happening even faster at that age. And again, you're also gonna see an increase in all the executive function pieces, which is organization and prioritizing, getting work done and turning it in, being immature, or excuse me, being more mature and more independent um, with things. You'll see just, it's a leap of maturity where the kids just seem older. Um, so no, it's not too late. And uh, it's actually a really fun experience with older ones. Okay, last question. And then I know that we have to get going. Um, do you have any tips for getting a child to participate in social situations when they may feel uncertain and may not be verbal enough to express their concerns? We had a couple different questions like this, you know, about entering the playground when they feel uncertain, social situations when they feel uncertain. Sure. So first and foremost, that's a red flag that there's a little something more going on, which is probably why you're watching this webinar in the first place. Um, but to me, it's we all need a certain degree of awareness or preparation or most of us. And the more areas of immaturity or concern we have, the more preparation we need. And so um, what I would do in that scenario is if it's going to be a play date at the park with a preschool class, I would go ahead of time so that the child can get familiar with the environment, familiar. And I would talk about who's going to be there and what it's going to look like. Um, you know, if you've got a child and you want to put them on a soccer team, I would go watch one or two soccer games before you do that. Um, so for any of those things, just the more preparation you can give in advance, the better. I also like a ton of role play. And again, these are kids, so we want to do it super silly, goofy, funny of, you know, hey, when you see a kid, should you do this? Or do you want to say, hi? And again, like be silly, be goofy, role play your student. Your child's going to be comfortable with you. So they're going to be silly, goofy with you. Um, and then remember, human touch is comforting. And so if you've got a child that's anxious and uncomfortable in those situations, staying there with them, light hand on their shoulder. Um, and again, talk about it afterwards. This is what you did really well. Was that fun when you played? Um, giving that positive reinforcement. Um, but again, keep in mind, if you're seeing those behaviors, it's coming from someplace. It's not a behavior. It's, you know, maybe they're overwhelmed or, you know, maybe we've got a six-year-old body, but that might be, you know, three or four development wise. And so the interactions and the comfort might look different um, because of those gaps in development. I'm sorry, I keep checking time. I've got no, one more that's minute. great. Okay. So um, that's all the time we have for questions for today. 
I saw we have an overwhelming amount of questions right now. We sorry. appreciate every, don't be sorry. I, I think we anticipated that. So we made the content a little bit less so we could get to your personal questions. I tried to read questions that were, um, you know, that we had multiple people asking around the same topic in hopes that we could touch on those pieces. I really do encourage you, reach out to your local center, ask them your question over the phone. There's no commitment by, by you know, taking the time to just call someone and talk to them more personally. That's what our staff is here for. We wanna help families, you know, whether you're enrolled in Brain Balance already, you were previously enrolled or not. So um, please give us a call. Again, stay connected with us, follow us on Facebook. We, we put out a lot of different information on a daily basis on our Facebook page and our Instagram page as far as content um, leading you back to blogs that are written by um, our team and as well please follow Dr. Rebecca Jackson at Dr. Rebecca Jackson on Instagram. Thank you all. Judge, for I'm brand new to social media so more <laughs> content to come soon. <laughs> Um, I did take down all of your suggestions. Again, next month, we're going to be talking about nutrition and how it affects behavior and focus. So come with questions to that as well. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.